Hi everybody, welcome to the Synthetic Intelligence Forum online. My name is Vic, I'm the host of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum. And today it's my pleasure to welcome a friend, Taka, to the, uh, to the live stream. Uh, Taka is the uh, Chief Data Scientist at the United States Government Accountability Office and also is the Director of their Innovation Lab. Uh, Taka is an excellent, um, excellent advocate on the topics of artificial intelligence generally, but also specifically when it comes to responsible AI, ethical AI, beneficial AI. So it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome Taka to the stream. And Taka, without further ado, uh, the, the star of the show, take it away. I'm going to put your slides up now. Welcome. Thank you so much, Vic. And, and it's such a pleasure to be with the Synthetic Intelligence Forum uh, today. Um, uh, you know, as Vic suggested, I am from the Government Accountab uh, Accountability Office which is a national audit organization for the United States. Uh, we're part of the national uh, cooperative of many national audit offices. And so we certainly um, occupy, I think, a leadership role when it comes to accountability challenges. And so for those who may not necessarily be familiar with GAO's work, uh, certainly we have a, a sort of wide variety of assessment um, uh, reports across you know, a complex set of uh, topic impacting the federal government. But what may not necessarily be known is that we are unique in the level of return on investments that we're able to measure. So over the past five years, on average, GAO has been able to return $165 worth of financial benefits for every dollar invested in GAO. And that is a unique, I think, across uh, among public sector entities. What that has translated into over the past decade or so is more than a trillion dollar worth of financial benefits return um, uh, on behalf of a Congress to the American people in the, in the form of financial um, uh, uh, sort of benefits stemming from the recommendations that we uh, generate uh, in, in our uh, audit reports. But it, we, we all know in terms of you know, emerging technology, uh, it's advancing every day, right? Whether it is artificial intelligence, whether it's cloud services, whether it's blockchain, uh, but too often oversight seems to be a, an afterthought. Uh, I think spe specifically in the context of AI, taking an auditor's perspective to models and the algorithm, I think is actually a very beneficial approach in terms of answering the question, uh, we certainly want to trust, but how do we actually verify not only the performance of those models, uh, the compliance postures of those models, uh, but certainly how do we then start answering the questions around disparate impacts, around the transparency, around the explainability, certain aspects of AI that are perhaps a little bit more squishy. Um, so I, I do want to talk about why GAO decided to address this, this issue of AI accountability. Uh, back in 2018, we issued a report um, that essentially forecasted AI to be a significant and transformative force within public sector. And, and certainly that has sort of, you know, bear out. There's, I think it's very rare these days to find a, a single federal agency here in the United States that are not working on some form of AI implementation, whether that is autonomous vehicle uh, from a department of tr uh, transportation, whether those are involving national security and intelligence application within DOD and, and other agencies, uh, whether those are some sort of benefit adjudication, identity verification. Um, so, it, you know, the, the list goes on. And, and certainly, I think computer vision, facial recognition, uh, healthcare delivery, drug discovery. Uh, there are many, many, many uh, use cases of AI that are now, uh, I think, proliferating across our, our federal agencies. So the idea here is that um, we know GAO will be called upon to assess implementations of these AI solutions. The time for us to figure out how is not when we receive those requests from Congress. So this is really a forward-looking part of GAO's mission in trying to un, uh, sort of answer the questions of how do we actually uh, empirically assess AI solutions. Um, one of the key conundrums that we were sort of trying to wrap, uh, grapple with is the, the idea of there's certainly many, many uh, frameworks out there uh, in terms of uh, you know guiding principle. OECD, I think, is a famous example of that. Uh, but certainly within the United States, there have been a half or a dozen or so different uh, AI principles. Um, our 
struggle has been that most of those principles were at a very high level. Uh, so, for example, you know, AI should not be biased, which I think it's a very laudable goal. But what does that mean to the day-to-day -day data scientists, program managers, agency executive uh, in terms of how to implement those ideals? And so our framework is really our attempt at pushing down those high-level principle down to key practices, key question, and more specifically, audit procedures where a third-party independent entity can come in and evaluate you know, whether it is governance documentation, whether it is data sets, whether it are you know, models themselves. Um, so you know, we'll talk through in terms of what the framework looks like. And, and just a little bit of a, um, a story around how we actually arrive at this framework. Uh, certainly, GAO did not create this in vacuum. Uh, we recognize AI is a complex topic that necessarily requires a bit of a, a sort of coordinated approach, uh, not only with our um, inspector general and oversight community here in the United States, but across our international partnership, uh, spe uh, specifically with Government of Canada, uh, UK, Singapore, and, and other colleagues at the international stage. Uh, but certainly state and local, academia, nonprofit, and even the industry providers. So we uh, back in September of 2020, in the midst of pandemic, uh, we convened a forum inviting all of these experts uh, cross sectorally come, uh, you know, virtually convening the, the forum at GAO. And, and over a two day period, we went through a number of sort of researchable question asking, for example, uh, what type of criteria does it make sense for AI assessment to be done under? Uh, what are some of the attributes of a documentation should we evaluate? What are some of the uh, technical artifacts that should be collected? And by the way, what do we do with them once we collect them? So uh, the, what you see here is really the, the results of that synthesis. Um, we took all of the inputs as well as based on some of our own experiences uh, developing AI solutions here at GAO, uh, developed this framework that has four specific pillars. Um, let me just start in the middle. You know, when it comes to data and when it comes to performance, I think those are uh, probably fairly intuitive when it comes to AI. Uh, AI, for, you know, in, for uh, in large extent, is uh, based on machine learning models that learns from data. So there are certain set of accountability and oversight consideration relative to the data, whether it's data trained to develop individual models or whether those are data that are then fed in, into the operation of the, the AI system itself. And then there are the performance considerations. Certainly, I think from a data science perspective, a lot of focus around accuracy, precision, recall, uh, you know, R value, P value, et cetera. Uh, but performance relative to, let's say, societal impact, as well as the value that we uphold as a public sector agency, uh, are you know, models and systems developed in a way that are consistent with those ideals. Now, book ending between data and performance is the idea, uh, notion of governance. Uh, so let me start with governance. And, and this is really talking about are there codified roles and responsibility, you know, value statements, uh, requirements documents that are not only done at the organizational level, but also at the system level. So roles and responsibility, a good example of that is many organizations are now appointing uh, sort of a chief ethics officer uh, or chief, um, you know, AI officer, uh, depending on, on what they're trying to do. But the question here is, are those individuals actually empowered to make change if they uncover something? Uh, you know, that may require either refinement or revisiting or redevelopment, uh, you know, whatever the scenario might call for. Um, so it, it does talk about, you know, specific roles and responsibility and the delegated authority to, the, the, to those individuals. But more broadly, it, you know, the notion of making sure that humans are uh, still in the center of the conversation. So that means treating AI as a team sports beyond just your software developers and your, your data scientists are, are there, for example, folks such as in the legal profession, folks that are in a sort of can bring the compliance perspective, people that can sort of bring privacy and civil liberty uh, points of view to the discussion. And then more importantly, 
the constituent in which the AI systems are meant to serve, are they represented in the conversation? And what level of impact are they able to um, uh, sort of effect when it comes to a development of AI? On the opposite end of the spectrum here is the idea of the monitoring. AI, I think in particular, it, because of its you know, tremendous speed at ingesting information and be able to sort of derive some sort of decisioning output, uh, it's very important that we not only monitor for the performance of AI system, but continuously monitoring them. So it's not just, you know, once we deploy them and we're done and we do some sort of, you know, annual audits or something along those lines. The framework here really stressed the importance of continuous monitoring. Uh, not only on the continuous monitoring of the performance, looking for data drift and model drift, et cetera, but as AI solutions scale up, asking the question whether those scalings are done appropriately. I'll just give an example. Uh, if an AI solution develop using one segment of the population or one geographic location, um, that may not necessarily scale well, uh, even across infrastructure, uh, across regions. And then we do want to pose the question of, might there be instances where AI, it's appropriate uh, to talk about in, in terms of sunsetting? You know, has AI exceeded its mandate or satisfied its uh, original objective where, um, you know, perhaps another form of technology has come online? So how does that sunsetting uh, retirement process uh, part of the conversation? Uh, so we think all these four pillars are sort of intertwined and we certainly recognize, uh, you know, many organizations have done have gone on their AI journey and are in some level of maturity relative to data performance, uh, monitoring or governance. Uh, so the idea here is not necessarily to always start from the beginning. There are uh, questions, there are practices laid out uh, that are targeting uh, you know, data scientists, program managers, and leadership of the agency to really think about in each of these pillars. And for um, oversight committees such as GAO, we also laid out um, audit procedures that should be applied. And, and the important part here is the criteria in which we are subjecting ourselves to, it's based on and grounded uh, in uh, what GAO has always done, which is the generally accepted government auditing standards. We affectionately call Yellow Book because Gagas, um, you know, it's a mouthful and, and difficult to pronounce. So under the Yellow Book principle, it says government programs uh, whether it's AI or not, right, must be effective, efficient, economical, equitable, and ethical. And I think those are five guiding principles that can be adapted in terms of how we assess AI across all these four pillars. And certainly we also looked at our green book, which much uh, talks much more to the internal control functions um, of any program. So many of these um, sort of practices and questions and auto procedure are sort of grounded not only from inputs coming from the expert panel, uh, but certainly grounded in uh, the yellow book and the green book, which are sort of our guiding North Star as far as uh, the gold standard of a, a um, government auditing standards is concerned. So let me move forward uh, to talk about uh, where does this accountability sit in the sort of a macro view? Um, you know, this is this accountability framework is really meant as a down payment for GAO um, for us to really start advocating oversight as a key component of AI development. Um, we certainly recognize there are different flavors of AI. There are different use cases for AI. There are different sort of calibration of consideration for AI. So, for example. Um, and autonomous, driven, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles uh, explainability for that particular use case will look very different, let's say a cancer diagnosis algorithm or even a benefits adjudication algorithm or some sort of uh, other computer vision type of implementations. So this accountability framework actually uh, looks to address the common life cycles of AI. You know, whether that's the initial design of that solution, whether that's the sort of iteration involved in the development, which often you know, is two step forward, one step backwards kind of, 
um, uh, sort of uh, back and forth iteration uh, when it comes to identifying the right data variables around uh, around the right models, around the right parameter tunings, et cetera. Um, so, and then take that developed uh, product and prototype into more of a deployment conversation where now scalability, security, infrastructure, resiliency becomes part of the conversation. And then again, how does continuous monitoring manifest itself once that solution is, is deployed? And then it is a virtuous cycle where every now and then we may revisit the design of that AI system um, to either refine it um, or to augment it, or you know, frankly, sometimes to sunset it as well. So knowing that there are nuances to different use case, our approach is really taking these super high uh, AI ethical frameworks that are floating out there and put them down at a level where it's consistent across all phases of the AI lifecycle. Uh, there, I think there are more works to be done in a sort of forward looking way uh, where you know other entities might take our accountability framework then further push down to let's say application in national defense or application in sort of a, a you know commercial sector application in sort of a benefits healthcare uh, supply chain you name it um, and then be able to sort of take that framework further down to um, to include those application domain specific nuances to the accountability framework. So this is really again you know just to reemphasize is GAO's down payment and we certainly expect um, us to continue. Uh, tackling you know AI oversight work, uh, but collaborating with other partners, international, state, local, and oversight community to continue to evolve this accountability framework as the AI technology itself is evolving. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, the the evolution of AI in in second. Uh, but I, I mentioned previously, you know, treating AI as uh, a team sports is paramount. Um, I, I know, you know there's, there's some level of disconnect between the training that uh, data scientists receive in, you know, in a sort of academic setting versus what it actually looks like in real life. Uh, because I think in, in, you know, for the most part in an academic setting, you know, data scientists are taught to focus on accuracy, precision, um, you know, modeling techniques and you know, et cetera. Uh, and so it's a little bit of reconciliation between what they're taught in school versus now there's an increasing expectation to make sure that uh, biases are detected, are remediated, and then addressed in a timely way. Uh, there are certainly interpretation that you know data scientists now need to be more of an ethicist. Um, uh, you know, our perspective is that it is unfair and probably unwise to expect one person or one type of you know people to be able to carry out all of the competency necessary to drive accountable AI. So this is where a human-centered accountable AI must be treated as a team sports. So whether those are the data scientists, for sure, software developer, you know, uh, those are the core technical competency that gets brought to the table. But privacy and security experts, risk management prof professionals, legal counsel, civil, civil liberty advocates, um, and, and then start from a user perspective and those individuals that are actually affected by the decisions rendered by AI system, I think all needs to be part of the conversation in driving accountable AI. And our framework do, uh, does talk about how to integrate them and the kind of um, uh, sort of audit procedure that we might apply to really evaluate to what extent uh, are these uh, different perspective integrated across governance, data, um, performance, and, and monitoring pillars. So, um, and, and that is certainly the approach that we took when we developed the, the accountability framework itself is that, you know, all of these uh, competencies were represented in addition to the you know, diversity of the organization. Like I mentioned, it involved international partner, state and local partner, oversight community, federal agencies, industry partners. Um, and then, you know, we, we're quite conscious in making sure that there is a social um, element to the diversity as well. And, you know, 61% of the panelists were women, 40% of the panelists were, you know, underrepresented minorities. So we want to make sure that when we're having an accountable 
a conversation on accountable AI, those accountability framework itself is derived through diversity of perspectives. So where do we go from here? Uh, well, first and foremost, take a, a sigh of relief that the accountability framework is published. And it's certainly, it's been uh, a long journey for us over the past year. Uh, my team really did a phenomenal, a phenomenal job of reconciling various points uh, coming out of the expert panel. Uh, but also be able to uh, uh, really integrate our own thought process and, and some of the established criteria in which we can anchor ourselves to, as opposed to coming up yet another uh, sort of oversight framework for others to follow. Um, and you know, there's a certainly fair amount of integration and coordination with agencies such as National Institutes of Standards and Technology, uh, White House, and, and other agencies that sort of cast uh, you know, large, uh, significant gravity in the, on the conversations of AI. Um, but our goal is to really start working with the oversight community to think about how this framework can be applied in their assessments of AI implementation. Um, but certainly, we we are looking towards uh, you know implementers, data scientists, service provider, product providers out there um, to really you know, put forth a framework, say, these are the kind of um, questions and practices that we expect federal governments to adhere to. And so for those uh, entities that are working with federal government in implementing AI solutions, um, these are the questions that are not just specifically asking federal government, right? I mean, especially when a lot of AIs are procured or bought, um, so those uh, there's a tangential touch point between federal agency as well as a service and product provider. So uh, we intend to continue to engage in conversation, but certainly uh, from forms such as this, we are very much interested in your feedback. Uh, what do we get right in this framework? What do we not get right in this framework? And you know, we certainly don't intend this uh, accountability framework to be an end all be all. Like I said, this is uh, our attempt at version 1.0. There will likely be a version 2.0 of the framework and a version 3.0 of the framework uh, going forward as well. And so I, I have this uh, little graphic, and it may be hard to read, that uh, really talks to where we are on the journey for AI itself. And I think, frankly, we are in the early stage of that AI journey. And, and this is graphic, something that I love, and I, we stole from DARPA, the defense um, advanced uh, research or organization. Um, and and I'll, I'll just set the context on why we adopted this characterization of AI. Uh, one of the things that we didn't want to um, get stuck on is some sort of definitional battle on what is AI. And I think a lot of um, sort of principles out there uh, try to define AI. And it certainly is a question that if you ask 10 data scientists, you'll get 50 different answers. Uh, and you know, so what we, for the purpose of the, the facilitating the expert panel, um, we were very clear to the panelists that one, the goal of this uh, you know, forum was really never to have a definitional, um, you know, battle around whose definition of AI was right, uh, and we're also not here to admire the problem, right? I mean, there were a lot of conversations around, oh, AI should not be biased. Well, we we take those um, challenges on its face value. We're much more interested in, well, how do we go from here? Um, so this is where the DARPA's representation, I think, came in handy rather than relying on a consensus definition, which by the way, one exists. Um, the federal government here, here in the United States has codified uh, the definition of AI in the fiscal year 2021 National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, I think it's sufficiently broad to allow for the continuing evolution of AI, um, but it also excludes with these type of a broad interpretation. So for example, um, you know, based on some of the uh, the definition of AI that I've seen, you would think Excel, you know, spreadsheet qualify as an AI solution. Um, so it is definitely a tricky proposition. So what we decided to do is really to 
instead of uh, relying on a consensus definition, is to drive towards more of the characterization of AI. And where we are relative to that characterization is certainly in what you know, DARPA calls second wave of AI. So first wave of AI, very much expert-driven, rules-based, uh, very uh, you know akin to you know for example TurboTax, right? You answer, uh, you you ask a bunch of questions, and based on the logic of the programming, it gives you a set of answers. It is not very good when um, the the questions being asked doesn't have some sort of pre-program um, uh, sort of uh, logic behind it. And so, I mean, but that's very much first wave of AI. And now we're squarely in the second wave, a largely machine learning driven, capable of specific tasks. For example, in computer vision, recognize this face uh, or some sort of benefit uh, adjudication, make sure that eligibility and criteria are applied um, in a fraud context, be able to isolate anomalies. Uh, but these machine learning algorithms are by and large still not capable of generalized reasoning or cognition. And frankly, the second wave of AI are still quite fragile in a sense that these uh, models are very susceptible to adversarial attacks and some other form of, forms of manipulation. Uh, what is over the horizon, and we're seeing some of this coming out of the research labs and, and other institutions, is the notion of a third wave of AI, where AI is now capable of generalization uh, or cognition, uh, very much similar to how humans can interpret their surrounding and make certain uh, judgment based on uh, perhaps sparsity of the data and be able to sort of fill in that missing gap. Um, you know, it, it's still early in the stage of second wave, I think, um, but it is so important for us to get the accountability right, right now, uh, before we have to deal with the, the increased complexity um, and the risks associated with a future third wave of AI. Um, so this is, you know, this, I, hopefully this answers the question of why GAO and why now, um, certainly, that's something that we initially, when we started this engagement, had to answer internally to our agency leadership as well to say, um, you know, usually an, a, a sort of oversight institution would normally wait for some maturity of a um, technology, right? Whether, uh, you know, it could be AI or it could be something else before we embark on this sort of oversight construct. Um, but this is where GAO philosophically want to be... Uh, much more forward-looking because it's not just AI. Uh, it also involves cloud services. There are a range of other emerging technologies that do require this type of perspective view. So blockchain, right? Uh, 5G, quantum computing, et cetera. Uh, so AI accountability framework is something that, um, you know, it's, it's one of many uh, emerging technology uh, issues that we're tackling prospectively. And, you know, as this sort of graphic lays out, we're still early in the conversations of AI, uh, but just very recently uh, in the fiscal year 2022 National Defense Authorization Act, there were more than a thousand page of new AI mandates. Um, and, and certainly there are a lot of conversations around uh, how to maintain sort of AI competitiveness and you know promoting national research, et cetera. So from our perspective, we don't think AI is a fad. We don't think AI is going to go away. Um, so coincidentally, you know, 2021 was GAO's centennial, right? Uh, we started in 1921 uh, doing punch card, ledger, audits. I think it's only appropriate that 100 years from now, uh, from then, you know, we're now doing audit based on algorithm, based on data science, and based on cloud services. Uh, so this, again, is sort of our... Um, contribution to the AI accountability conversation in terms of applying an auditor's point of view to really empirically not only assessing the, um, the performance and the compliance aspects of AI, but really start asking, well, how do we actually assess biases? How do we actually assess disparate impacts? Um, how do we assess you know, very sort of uh, softer qualities, and, and but you know the um, the consequence is so great, right? I mean, the the responsibility for public sector to get its AI implementation right is paramount. Uh, many of our implementations certainly have life or death uh, consequences, 
And at the very least, we don't want to be in the business of, of promoting long health stereotypes, uh, long health sort of discrimination reflected in what the data is telling us. Um, so, you know, uh, again, this is sort of our, um, uh, our framework. And, and I know this is a very fast uh, sort of flyby of the accountability framework. Uh, so happy to answer any question um, the forum participants may have. And, and you know, certainly happy to talk more about um, the journey which we internally took to get to this stage. Um, and then, you know, the, you know, so uh, Vic, if I may turn it back to you in terms of, you know, whether there are questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Taka. Excellent presentation. Great, uh, great narrative on sort of the history of the initiative. And really, uh, I think that slide with the road really contextualized what came earlier, what's likely to come later. So I'd like to start with one question. We have some good questions in the chat, which I'll also pop up on your screen. Sure. I guess my first question is, you know, when we think about AI as software systems, as socio-technical systems, uh, GAO already has frameworks to govern software systems and technologies. So when you were crafting this AI uh, AI governance framework, Taka, how did the interplay, how did the complementarities and synergies come into play between these various frameworks? Yeah, no, absolutely great question. Uh, we certainly collaborated with our information technology and cybersecurity team as well. Uh, part of our environmental scan initially was looking at the existing IT related statutes out there. Um, but our assessment is that a lot of those IT um, frameworks are very compliance oriented. Did you configure this type of control? Did you configure this type of boundary? Did you configure, did you answer these questions, et cetera? Um, you know, while there's some overlap with how AIs are being developed, this is where I think the nature of data science is fundamentally different than how software development or AI cycle deals with. Um, I mentioned a little bit of a, the development cycle oftentimes is two step you know, forward, one step backwards, whereas software development tends to be very uh, progressively forward in terms of how you de design the sprints, how you design milestone, how do you design um, those uh, sort of deployment, you know, apertures. Um, I think for for data science, you know, certainly learning the lessons from prior IT oversight framework for sure, but applying sort of a unique uh, sort of algorithmic lens. One thing that is, I think, keenly uh, different than let's say IT organization is that AI by definition is probabilistic. There's no such thing as a binary AI. You know, it's either 0% or 100%. It's always with some sort of nuance of based on, you know, the data that we're able to ingest, we think 65.2% that this face that, you know, this model is telling us is in fact either a cat or panda or something else. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a little bit of um, a pivot. And then I think the speed in which AI can manifest not only opportunities and benefits, is equally sometimes scary when it comes to societal impacts, right? Algorithms do not need to rest. Algorithms do not take holidays. Um, algorithm can sort of voraciously ingest um, data uh, with a tremendous speed, with tremendous skill. So any little uh, intended or unintended biases uh, gets sort of magnified pretty quickly. And so I think a time component is also part of this conversation to say, uh, we developed this framework, again, you know, targeting uh, federal government for sure, but it's also a little bit of a wake up call for us in the oversight community. Do we have the workforce in house necessary to conduct a credible uh, assessment of AI? And if so, can we do so quickly? Right, and an and AI audit report that takes 24 months to issue doesn't do anybody any good. By the time that report comes out, the rest of the world would have gone on to something else. So how do we ask these questions contemporaneously um, and, and then in a timely way and in a credible way to evaluate AI? Uh, so I think there's a commonality in terms of how AI does leverage certain IT framework to make it sing, to make it happen. But I think AI itself has a specific set of nuanced uh, accountability challenges that compelled us to really develop this framework. 
Thank you, Taka. That's an excellent uh, answer. And I think just to build on that answer, we have a great question here from one of our community members is, can you talk a little bit about the enforceability and sort of the deterrence aspects of your policy? Who's going to do the monitoring? Where is the resourcing coming from? And does this framework actually have teeth? Uh, yeah, so I, I think that that's a great question. So a common misconception is that GEO is not a regulatory agency. You know, we don't have a badge wielding gun carrying officers that breaks down door to says your AI is not compliant. Um, but what we do as an oversight function is that we generate these assessment reports and we produce recommendations. Those recommendations are usually sent, well, not usually all the time, they're always sent to Congress. So there's a level of visibility and they're publicly available um, at GAO.gov. So there is an element of, um, while GAO doesn't have a regulatory function, but because of our nonpartisan stance, because of our reputation as an objective sort of high quality uh, oversight entity, what we say matter. And usually more often than not, um, agency themselves uh, find it in their own interest to address it before they get hauled in front of the Congress to ask very difficult questions. Um, but certainly as part of the recommendation, we wanna make sure that uh, it's not just GAO's edict that to issue these recommendations. We usually work with the agency to understand um, constraints, to understand the facts and circumstances in which perhaps some of these deficiencies are built in. And so our recommendations are tend to be you know, nuanced in that way. So it's not really meant as a bludgeoning tool. Um, and then the, the point I'll just add is because agency usually do adopt GEO's recommendation. Now, sometimes it may take a little longer than we like, but you know, they you generally adopt. And this is one of the reasons why we're able to measure the financial impacts of our work. Uh, the point of this accountability framework could also be viewed as a bit of an open book test, right? GAO is evaluator. We're telling you the kind of questions and the procedures that we will be applying. So uh, before GAO starts the evaluation, the programs um, uh, and you know uh, and, and sort of implementers should really look at the kind of questions that we're asking and perhaps uh, build that into their current uh, sort of journey of implementation. Because sooner or later, either GAO or our inspector generals or other sort of uh, independent audit agency will be asking these questions. Thank you, Taka. Great, uh, great answer. And uh, also related to that, I think we have another excellent question here, which is that, you know, Taka, when we think about AI systems as socio-technical systems, there's a the technology part, the software, and then there's the human in the real world making uh, things happen. Uh, how, is your, how does your framework handle this multi-level nature of AI systems uh, when you're looking at the overall and when you're also looking at the specific? Yeah, great question. Uh, a, a bit of a sort of an anecdote I'll share. When I first showed up to GAO, you know, one of my brilliant idea was to develop like a natural language processing capability to help our lawyers and we have a lot of lawyers here at GAO uh, to really triage many of the uh, the contract bid protests that GAO actually handles and, and that's uh, sort of I think a little known function of GAO as well um, and so the, the, the lessons learned on first day when I showed up at GA is that context matters. From the lawyer's perspective, they interpreted my idea as a replacement of their job. We, we're now gonna come up with an AI lawyers to adjudicate these complicated cases where in fact my intent was to really uh, to support the decision-making process by driving efficiencies, but not necessarily supplanting those professional judgments. So, I, I mean, I, I take that question to heart. Uh, certainly, I'll, I'll give you another example, right? When it comes to autonomous vehicle, uh, you kind of just want the vehicle to take you where you need to go. You don't necessarily need to know, well, why did you take right turn here? Why did you take a left turn here? Why did you apply a brake? Why did you accelerate? Um, that will actually be a hindrance to a, a sort of autonomous vehicle um, driving experience. But in that context, this is why the evaluation matters so much, right? Because a lot of uh, human decisions are then delegated to machine to execute. We need to make sure that, sure, the camera can actually recognize a rock on the street or a cat on the street or a stop sign on the street. And it's sort of such a high precision 
um, because you know, rightly or wrongly, apparently the society places a lot more, uh, a lot higher bar when it comes to self-driving car, where we know there are tens and thousands of human-driven car fatalities out there. Um, but that's a you know different conversation another day. Uh, but knowing that those decisions are being delegated to the system itself, I think this is where the evaluation and the bar for that evaluation needs to be set very high. Um, on the, another sort of a simplified uh, case on the opposite spectrum, right? Let's say um, I, I love Netflix, so this is no disparaging to Netflix, um, but I do enjoy their movie recommendations. You, know, you might also like this genre or horror uh, you know, film, or you might like this genre of comedy, whatever the case might be. Um, those are I, what I interpret as advice to human. You know, whether I watch them or not, it's sort of my decision, right? But uh, AI's tell, AI solution is telling me or suggesting that I might want to pay attention to this. In that case, maybe the bar of clearance is a little bit lower. In other words, if I don't like the recommendation that Netflix is telling me, no harm, no foul, right? It, you know, my day continues to go on. Sun will still come out tomorrow. Um, and so this is where, depending on the facts and circumstances and the risk calibration, there may be different layers of accountability question that needs to be asked. Uh, so our framework doesn't get into the uh, sort of all of the specific prescriptive, you know, delineation of risk, but rather what we say in the governance specifically section is, you know, evaluate what is your, in your AI system intended to address and then as part of that conversation, what is the deliberate risk identification and risk management process? So if there is a life or death consequences, yeah, set the bar super high, and then all of the data performance and continuous monitoring will be based on that identified set of risk to address that high bar of clearance. If, for example, you are developing something like a product recommendation where if you're wrong, you know, not necessarily you know, the end of the world, uh, that, it's, again, is a risk calibrated conversation so that we're not trying to take a one size fits all to uh, AI accountability. As a matter of fact, we know that will never work. Um, so not only are there nuances in uh, use case and applications of AI, but same thing with that risk calibration as well. Thank you, Taka. And uh, building on the comment you made about sort of the perception sometimes that AI will replace jobs, I know that when it comes to employment policy, Taka, sometimes there is this conversation of sort of an AI stream or sort of a, a, a tranche of, of people that had a skills development plan just for AI. Can you comment a little bit on that, Taka, what your re reactions are to this kind of line of reasoning? Yeah, um, you know, going back to my comment that, you know, I, I firmly believe AI is a team sport. Um, I think AI have a tendency to be lumped into this sort of monolithic term, right? Do more AI or hire more AI or buy more AI. Uh, but in reality, what we mean is, you know, get more data engineering competency, get more data scientists, get more mathematician, get more infrastructure cloud services expert to work together um, to establish a sort of a quality AI system. But somehow AI just, you know, it's a convenient shorthand to say do more AI. Um, I think workforce is definitely a challenge, especially for, you know, here in the United States. Uh, I'll give you an example. Our Office of Personnel Management doesn't even have a job series that describe how federal government consider uh, a competency such as data science. Um, there are some push in the legislative language that certainly talks about you know more AI, uh, maintain competitiveness of AI, and, and that does require sort of workforce, right? Um, we actually recently provided uh, some sort of a suggested changes to the legislative language to say the goal is not to create AI job series. The goal should be to create a more robust competency that are required to build AI. In other words, the spectrum of digital services, you know, whether that's data engineering, whether that's data science, whether that's visualization, whether that's infrastructure, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And all of them, depending on the ratios of ingredients that you pick, can end up creating different dishes of AI. Um, and frankly, that also applies to the oversight communities as well. 
if you have an audit agency full of accountants, full of performance auditors? Do you have the necessary infrastructure uh, skill sets mm-hmm. uh, and the technical know-how to even be able to not only collect these complicated and complex technical artifact, and what do we do with them once we collected them? Because you know, no point collecting them if you don't have a means of evaluating them. And then above and beyond that, what is the, um, the criteria that we apply to evaluate these technical artifacts? So uh, I talked about you know, AI being a probabilistic system, right? Just because a particular machine learning model gave a 99.9% accuracy or recall in one cloud environment, we collected those models and tried to replicate that performance in a different environment. Is the goal really trying to replicate it or is there some reasonable standard that we can apply uh, to assess the performance, the, the data elements, um, the rationale behind selection as the variable, et cetera. Um, so I think workforce is paramount. And so talking about accountable AI, I think, again, laudable goal, um, but the, the, where the rubber meets the role is, do you have the, the, the sort of multidisciplinary sort of team sports mentality, not only to the implementation of AI, but also the oversight of AI? Okay, great. Thank you, Taka. So perhaps we can just get to the last question now. And you you, you touched on elements of this question in, uh, in your previous answers, but uh, in terms of your future roadmap, are there plans, given that you said AI, the stakes are very different given the context, given the use case. So is there a view once this framework stabilizes to certainly have one work stream to go to version two, version three of this general framework, but mm-hmm. also to have sub streams where you're going to have specific frameworks for different areas? Short answer is yes, um, but we certainly don't expect GAO to be the only voice in that conversation, right? Um, and even prior to issuance of this accountability framework, we have done technology assessment relative to applications of AI in healthcare, in diagnosis, in drug discovery. You know, that's all the rage these days. How do you how do you model different proteins so that you're not spending years and years over time? and developing vaccine. And I think the COVID vaccine is a good example of having leveraged some of that AI capabilities. We have done technology assessments and forensic algorithm and facial recognition. Uh, So I think that portfolio of oversight work will continue to evolve. Um, I think for the accountability framework, we certainly intend to work with our mission team and our oversight partners to say, try it out, right? Tell us uh, various nuances that perhaps we missed or should be included in the next iteration of this framework. Uh, We have had a conversation with several academic institutions to say, might there be a collaborative opportunity uh, while GAO sort of looks at this general framework, but individual organization might tackle to say, how do we take that framework, built it in for let's say computer vision or some other specific forms of of AI implementation. Um, This is where I think open source is a absolutely a beautiful construct, right? You can sort of imagine perhaps like some sort of GitHub repository of AI frameworks specifically adapted to computer vision or AI frameworks specifically adapted to self-driving car or AI frameworks specifically adapted to some sort of biomolecular application uh, for drug discovery. Um, So that is where we are in the whiteboarding process. Um, the, the, the immediate goal for now is really to make sure that there's an uh, understanding of the, what this framework does, and, but more, equally important, what it doesn't do, and then continue to partner with our counterparts at NIST, at White House, and, and others uh, to really, because, you know, again, this is not an end-all, be-all for AI accountability. Uh, there's certainly a conversation with OECD, there are conversations with other international partners that continues on this evolution. And I think more, most recently, uh, Responsible AI Institute are, so is rolling out the notion of a model car and a data card. Um, and certainly that is one example of documentation I think is consistent with our governance pillar within our accountability framework. Um, so part of our goal is making sure that we're not just you know, mandating or suggest a part of accountability AI out way out in the left field that is not consistent with the rest of the conversation. Um, but the one last piece I'll just sort of touch on, and this was a bit of a surprise, right? We, we talk about accountable AI as though that is a generally accepted construct. Right. Um, but 
in one of the very last session of our expert panel, what you know, one of the comments raised was, you know, data scientists' job is to focus on the performance aspects of AI. So again, they're taught to focus on accuracy, precision, et cetera. Um, is it really fair or is it really appropriate um, when the data scientists are, are called to represent the data to their best of ability based on what the data tells them? Or is it fair to expect them to uh, mold that data to reflect the world in which we wish we lived in? Uh, very valid conversation. So I think when we talk about accountable AI, it's important to recognize this may not necessarily be a universally adopted construct so that we shouldn't all be in a sort of echo chamber of talking about, yeah, you know, AI ethics is great. Uh, there are certainly uh, conversations around training. There are certainly, uh, you know, additional work that to be done before accountable AI is sort of a, a um, almost like, like air we breathe and water we drink, it just part of the standard practice. Uh, because you certainly don't talk about, uh, you, you don't hear a whole lot of ethical principle being developed into cloud services, for example, or quantum computing or any other uh, prior forms of technology. And, but this is certainly a topic that, is, you know, focus on the AI implementation itself. So recognizing that you know, while it's such an important topic, uh, there are more uh, consensus to be developed in, in this area. Very interesting. Thank you, Taka. And I think that uh, that brings us to a very nice uh, place to talk about, uh, to close and to just say that, as you mentioned, you know, there is the assessment side to this where there are metrics, but then there are also interventional techniques like uh, reject option based classification and optimized pre processing and re weighting and things like that. So, excellent uh, sort of perhaps a topic for the next talk, Taka, as you mentioned, that there's another set of conversations we can have about autonomous vehicles and the ethics of autonomous vehicles. Who do you hit? Who do you not hit? So, uh, thank you so much on behalf of the Synthetic Intelligence Forum for a thoughtful and thought-provoking, uh, rich and rewarding exchange of ideas. And we'd love to have you back, Taka, in a couple of months to see um, where the journey has taken this framework. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Yes. Bye for now.